We're somehow just a few short months away from the start of another presidential election season. I know I haven't recovered from the last one either. But this time around, not only will we be fighting over which candidate is the best choice, we also may be fighting about how we make that choice with the Electoral College. That, of course, is the group of 538 people across the country who actually elect the president instead of we the people at large. Each state gets a different number of electors based on how many people represent them in Congress. And as explained by Schoolhouse Rock, which is where I get almost all of my constitutional knowledge, when we vote for a president every four years, what we're actually doing is voting for these people, the electors, who go on to represent our interests at the national level and ultimately pick the next president. The problem for some is that almost every state operates on a winner-take-all system meaning each of those states' electors vote in single blocks for the same person, even if as many as 49% of their state voted for another candidate. So is the will of the people really being carried out? My next guest says no, and he, along with people like former Governor Bill Weld, are leading a series of lawsuits to put an end to it all. Lawrence Lessig is professor at Harvard Law, former presidential candidate, and the founder of the nonprofit group Equal Citizens. Larry, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Jim. Before we get into the merits of what you're doing, uh, tell us what the Constitution says and does not say about the Electoral College. So all the Constitution does is set up the system of electors being appointed by the states, and then they vote on a certain day for the president. It doesn't say anything about how the electors get allocated in the state, except that, of course, it has to comply with the other parts of the Constitution. You can't say just men can be electors or only you can only vote for women. So what are you guys proposing? What's this litigation about? Well, so all states except two allocate their electors, as you just described, winner take all. Maine and Nebraska? Maine and Nebraska. Okay, yeah. What we're saying is that the state, the state should allocate their electors proportionally. And the reason that's so important is that the winner-take-all system concentrates all of the attention of a presidential campaign in just the battleground states. So in 2016, 99% of spending was in 14 states. Now, those states don't represent America. They're older, they're whiter, they have 20th century industry. There are seven and a half times the number of people working in solar energy as mine coal, but you never hear about solar energy in a presidential campaign because none of them live in the battleground states. But you hear about coal miners all the time because they're in the battleground and states. And it's not just money. It's appearances. It's the presence of the candidates Absolutely. in their campaign. The only they essentially time. ignore the vast Absolutely. majority of the United States. They're in New York and California and Boston when they're raising money, but that's the only reason they ever leave those states. So Maura Healy, who is uh, representing the state uh, uh, against you, at least in the obviously in the Massachusetts uh, uh, litigation, said is there's no constitutional violation that essentially all the candidates are treated the same. There's no equal protection problem. Where's she wrong? Well, she's clearly wrong if a million people can vote Republican in the state of Massachusetts and not a single elector gets allocated to a Republican vote from the Electoral College. What the system does is, as the Supreme Court said in a case called Gray versus Sanders, the system counts the votes for the purpose of throwing them away. So if you don't happen to be in the majority, when you vote for the president of the United States, your vote just does not But matter. couldn't you say that about the final, too? I well, mean, that's it, the point. It's the intermediate stage. Of course, at the final stage, we've got to just pick the winner. But in this intermediate stage, as we're counting on the way up, you're counting votes and throwing them away. And there's no constitutional reason to do that. And what we can see is that it produces this massively dis unrepresentative president, not, just, not to mention the fact that it increases the probability that you'll have minority presidents like the one we have right now who don't win the popular vote but win in the electoral And college. like Al Gore, whose lawyer in Bush v. Gore, is David Boyce, is representing him here. Uh, who else is with you? I mean, this is a bipartisan thing. This is not just people unhappy that Hillary Clinton is not president of the United yeah, States, Yeah, in fact, in fact, I don't think this is at all about the results of the last election. It's about creating a president who cares about all of America. So we're f suing in four states. California and Massachusetts are the states where we're suing on behalf of Republicans. And Texas and South Carolina, where we're suing on behalf of Democrats. And in all of those states, what we're saying is those voters who are in the minority deserve an equal right to have their vote counted. You know, most people who want to uh, tinker, you may not like that term, but tinker with the Electoral College, fix it, for lack of a better expression, uh, 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 don't want to abolish it because of how cumbersome and dangerous the constitutional amendment process would be. You have other reasons why you oppose outright abolition. What are they? Well, you know, if you look at the main alternative that's out there, the thing called the National Popular Vote Project, 
which would basically allocate the electors to the winner of the popular vote. Which where Massachusetts belongs to. Massachusetts belongs to And that. if ultimately 270 electoral vote states belong to, I think it's like 170 something yeah, now, exactly then right. it'd be all over. The popular vote would determine right. the outcome without abolishing the electoral right. college. Now what people are worried about with that is that it would create flyover democracy. What does I that mean, mean? You only care about California and New York, maybe Texas, Chicago, but the rest of the country doesn't matter because all you're trying to do is get the most votes and you would get the votes in a small number of states. The advantage to the argument we're advancing is that it would create an incentive for candidates to care about every state because you'd have to get an elector in every single state. So you would make sure that everybody's vote is being weighed in the process and you'd create an incentive for candidates to focus on the whole country, not just the coasts and not just the battleground states. So right to be now. clear, your opposition to whatever that's called, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, is the same argument you have about outright abolition of the Electoral College or no? Well, the outright abolition problem is you can't get an amendment through this Congress. If so you that's could? Your, if you could. I mean, I, you see, I'm a little conflicted. Personally, Why? I like the idea of national popular vote. But what I'm saying is if you care about making sure states have an equal say, and especially if you care about small states, you should like our solution over that. But I've read other criticisms of yours of the electoral, uh, of abolition of the Electoral College, and I'm paraphrasing you, so obviously you'll correct me when I'm uh, misrepresenting your position, that you want sort of a stopgap yeah. set of people yeah. who, if the people really make an insane choice, I don't want 538 people that almost no one has ever heard of who are party members, for the most part, party activists, overriding my vote. Do you? I don't either. But here, look, this is the reality. We've got another set of cases where we're trying to resolve the question whether electors can actually be bound to vote one way or the other. Because, you know, in this last election, seven electors voted against their pledge. Uh -huh. uh, and three of them were fined in Washington state for the first time in American history. And I think as a constitutional law professor, there's a 99 percent chance the Supreme Court's going to look at this and it's going to say, the Constitution says these are free agents. They get to vote however they want. And when that decision comes down, I think all of us are going to be legitimately terrified about the system that's been left to us after 200 years of, uh, of uh, um, lack of amendment. So, so you're more hopeful in the Supreme Court than you are in the Federal District Court because Patty Saris was not exactly wildly enthusiastic, the judge. Well, that's right. I mean, I think that, you know, a lower court judge has got to think very conservatively about this. But I think what we are, are increasingly getting people to see is that the ordinary justification we have for the Electoral College, that it benefits small states, isn't true about winner take all, right? Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, Florida are not small states. It happens that uh, New Hampshire is among the battleground states, but that's an accident, right? So the point is it doesn't benefit the small states. It's not what the framers intended. It produces a result that distorts our democracy. So what's the argument for it? And then if you say there's no argument for it, and you could actually give everybody an equal play in our democracy by allocating it proportionally and give the attention to small states, then what's the argument against that? Keep us updated. Nice okay. to see you, Larry. Great to see you, Jim. Appreciate it. And if you want more information on the effort, you can find it online at equalcitizens.us.